Hello, my name is DC Eagle of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. Uh, as you can tell by the expressions of the people to my left, it's been a great Independence Day here at JPL. And here to talk about the NASA Juno mission at Jupiter we have with us today, Jeff Yoder, Acting Associate Administrator, NASA Science Mission Directorate, NASA Headquarters in Washington. Diane Brown, Juno Program Executive, NASA Washington. Scott Bolton, Juno Principal Investigator, Southwest Research Institute, San Antonio. Rick Nybakken, Juno Project Manager from JPL. Guy Butelshees, Director of Interplanetary Missions, Lockheed Martin Space Systems, Denver, Colorado. Steve Levin, Juno Pro Pro Project Scientist from JPL. And to start things off, we'll uh, go to Jeff Yoder. Jeff? Thanks. What a feeling. <laughs> a mission of this complexity uh, to accomplish tonight is, is, is just truly amazing. And it really highlights the partnership and the teamwork between, between NASA and our contractors and our partners to be able to achieve this, this amazing, amazing mission. But you know, there's one, one group that I also want to thank, and that's the families who really sacrificed their time to allow the scientists and engineers to spend the long days, the travel, uh, to make this happen. So to the family, thank you. You are part of this mission. If we could, I'd like to, uh, to roll a short video that will show some of the the stress, the anxiety, the excitement that led up to uh, tonight. So if we could roll the video, please. Systems, this is NAV. Go ahead, NAV. Yeah, we see the expected uh, sharp shift upward and the Doppler residuals indicating the main engine has started. Copy that. That's good news. We are uh, still awaiting confirmation of that in the tone. All stations on June Accord, this time we see the tone for minimum burn timer. Almost there. All stations on June Accord, we have the tone for burn cutoff on Delta B. Roger, go move, Juno. Juno. Welcome to Jupiter. Burn time was 2102 seconds, only differing one second off of the pre burn predictions. Again, very happy that you could share this moment with us. Let me turn this over now to Diane Brown. Thank you, Thank you. Jeff. I, I was asked to talk about what it feels like to have this success, and it's just, I mean, it's overwhelming. The team, the amount of time and effort everyone put into this, and the risks that were overcome, it's amazing. I mean, the more you know about the mission, you know just how tricky this was, and to have it be flawless. I mean, I really can't put it into words. I, you imagine what it might feel like, but to actually have it, to know that we can all go to bed tonight, not worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> It's pretty awesome. So I, that's, that's really all I can say. It's just amazing. So Scott, how do you feel? <laughs> NASA did it again. <laughs> that says it all to me. And I am so happy to be part of the team that did that. I, I mean, this team has worked so hard, and we have just such great people. And it's just a, it's almost like a dream coming true right here. And, um, you know, I was, I had to go back and get my family and drive them in here this, this earlier this evening. And I, they get in the car and they've lived this. I mean, my kids are, you know, 12 and 13 and their, their whole life has been Juno, basically. And uh, I'm driving in and they say, I said, so that's it. I just want you guys to remember there's some risk here tonight, you know. I said, by the time we're driving back to the hotel tonight, Either we're going to be in orbit or we won't. <laughs> and we're in. <laughs> and now the fun begins, the science. So let me turn it over to Rick to tell you more about what happened tonight. In a minute. But first, we have to take care of some business. So we prepared a contingency communications procedure. And guess what? We don't need that anymore. So tonight, through tones, 
Juno sang to us, and it was a song of perfection. Do you realize that after a $1.7 billion journey, a billion mile, <laughs> they're going to kill me. After a 1.7 billion mile journey, we hit our burn targets within one second on a target that was just a tens of kilometers large. Isn't that incredible? That's how good our team is. And that's how well the Juno spacecraft performed the night. You see a handful of people up here, but what we represent is a team of almost 900 people that built and launched Juno, and roughly 300 people that operated it and got us all the way through into Jupiter orbit tonight. And we have a lot of team members here with us, so I'd like to shout out to our team members here in Pasadena. And we also have team members in Denver, Colorado, at Lockheed Martin. So I'd like to say congratulations to the team. You are the best. You nailed it tonight. And Guy, over to you. Thank you. Um, there's a saying, uh, you know, it's not rocket science. Well, today, yeah, it really was rocket science, okay? So to put a spacecraft in orbit around the most intense planet in the solar system, you've got to fire the main engine at exactly the right time, at exactly the right place. Uh, that's not easy. And it may look easy uh, when you watch it, but behind the scenes, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes on. There's a tremendous amount of pride and dedication and passion that this team has put into this. And uh, I just couldn't be prouder to be part of this partnership uh, with NASA. Uh, putting an orbiter around Jupiter is, uh, you know, that's the reason we all go into this profession, is, uh, is you know, it's science fiction and yet it's fact. And uh, so the spacecraft uh, performed extremely well. Uh, we fired our main engine, uh, and uh, it, uh, right now we've only got tones, and we talked to you a little bit about tones, which is kind of a very low data rate uh, that kind of gives you some milestones, gives you some, some basic facts about how the spacecraft is doing. Um, but we're just now, we've got the spacecraft back pointed at the sun uh, and the antenna back on Earth. We're starting to get the higher rate data down. And so we've got a kind of a long night ahead of us because we're going to be going through that data in meticulous detail to make sure that the spacecraft is healthy uh, and that we're prepared to go forward to the rest of the mission, which is why we're here to get all that great science. Um, preliminary looks are that uh, the spacecraft is performing well. Uh, it did everything that it needed to do. And, uh, and so uh, we're very pleased uh, with its performance. Uh, but again, we've got a lot of work in front of us to, to really dive into that and see how it's going to do. But uh, looking ahead, uh, we're uh, anxious to hear uh, the navigation performance and, uh, and the orbit we're in, and then looking ahead to, to, to really starting to get uh, Scott and uh, all his science team, all that great science data, which is why we're there. So thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve. So, uh, you get a, a, a really great dedicated team of a lot of people working really hard for a really long time. You can do some amazing things. And <clears throat> it's, it's amazing, it feels wonderful, and it's also just the beginning. So, I want to remind you all, uh, we're looking forward to turning the science instruments back on in a couple of days. And what I'm really looking forward to is getting up close and personal with Jupiter in about 53 days on August 27th with all of our science instruments on and taking data and uh, see what we can find. Thanks for a great night to the whole team, and I guess back to Scott. So we're there. We're in orbit. We conquered Jupiter. <laughs> So, as many of you uh, may know, we um, were so focused on this uh, tricky maneuver tonight that we shut off all the instruments um, five days earlier um, just to make sure that nothing else was going on in the spacecraft. But prior to that, we managed to collect some special data that I want to share with you tonight. And uh, it takes a little bit of an introduction so that you can understand what what's going on. So several hundred years ago in 1610, Galileo took the first telescope and 
pointed it up in the sky, and he saw Jupiter. And he noticed over the course of a couple of days that the stars nearby Jupiter were moving into different positions each night. And somehow, he figured out by that fact that they must be orbiting Jupiter. And it was a revelation. And it changed our culture and our perspective of ourselves forever. Earth was not the center. And he imagined this, and after that, for centuries, we have imagined how the planets move and how the stars move. And we've only been aided with computer animation or the efforts of Hollywood. Well, tonight that's going to change because Juno, on its approach, managed to capture a movie of Jupiter and its moons. And we're going to show that to you tonight. And for the first time, all of us together will actually see the true harmony in nature. This is what it's about. This is what Jupiter and its moons look like. This is what our solar system looks like if you were to move out. It's what the galaxy looks like. It's what the atoms look like. It's harmony at every scale. And so we finally are touching out to the cosmos. And I'm very happy and pleased to be able to share this video with you. So uh, we'll need a little bit of the lights down. It's a bit of a dark film. It's pretty far away. And the reason we're able to capture this video is the camera on Juno is very special. It's not like the ordinary cameras that go on spacecraft. It was designed to capture a picture of the pole of Jupiter. And that required the camera framing to be very similar to your iPhone or Android or whatever smartphone you happen to carry. So when you look at this video, you can imagine yourself sitting on a chair on Juno, maybe right next to the Legos. <laughs> and you're holding up your phone making the movie so that you can share it with your loved ones or friends back home because you're on vacation. And here's the greatest vacation and journey I can imagine. So here it is. Uh, can we get that animation, please?
We worked really hard on that, and I'd like to think that Galileo would really have enjoyed that movie. Great. Thank you, Scott. And we're going to open it up to questions from here first at JPL. Uh, please state your name and media affiliation, and uh, we'll get to you. Okay, we'll go to uh, questions from social media. Jason, do we have a question or two? Indeed, there's a lot of questions coming in on social media here. Um, so Scott, you mentioned, uh, this one comes from Twitter user Matt here. Uh, you mentioned that Juno is going the fastest of any spacecraft. How fast is it going? Uh, well, it's already slowed down a little bit. <laughs> but at the time of the Jupiter, of the Jupiter orbit insertion, um, I think relative to Earth, it was about 165,000 miles an hour. All right, next question here uh, comes from Nicole. How soon before we start getting information back about Jupiter? So, well, you saw, we've already gotten some information about Jupiter. And in fact, that movie actually had some science in it because it, you may have noticed Callisto, the outermost moon, was dimmer than the other ones. We didn't know that. That was a new science discovery because at that phase angle, Callisto was uh, less bright than the other ones. We don't know why. We'll have to figure that out. Um, we will turn the science instruments on in about a couple days, and we will start gathering data, and um, we get our first up and close personal look at Jupiter with all our eyes and ears open at the end of August, because our first orbit is 53 days. Wonderful. This question comes from Ustream user uh, T. Samoloff, who asks, uh, since the maneuver was executed nearly perfectly, did Juno save any significant amount of fuel that would allow NASA to extend the mission? <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically what we'll do is, uh, as I said, we're getting that telemetry down. Right now we just have the tones down indicating the completion of the burn and, uh, and when the burn completed, but what we need to take a look at is the performance of the main engine. And so that'll be part of the, uh, of the expanded data set that we'll be getting down. So we'll know a little more about how efficient the engine was uh, during the maneuver, uh, and then we can uh, come back to Scott and tell him if he's got a little bit of extra to play with. But we're off to an excellent start. Guy, and we have a question from here at JPL. Uh, please state your name and media affiliation. Hi, Amanda Barnett, CNN Digital. Uh, that video is pretty awesome. Could you tell us a little bit more about, about it, Scott, and a little bit why that's so significant, seeing the motion of those moons around Jupiter? Uh, sure. I mean, you know, in all of history, we've never really been able to see the motion of any heavenly body uh, against another. I mean, Juno managed to get when we flew by the Earth a few years ago, we saw, um, we were able to capture a movie of the Earth and the Moon together, but we couldn't see the whole orbit. And I think when you, when you can first realize how that works, you have multiple moons, the Galilean moons, going around Jupiter, and each one is going around at a different speed based on its distance away from the planet. I mean, this is the king of our solar system and its disciples going around it. I mean, this is, I mean it, it's also representative of nature. This is how we look. That's a mini solar system. And so I think it's very, it, 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 to me, it's very significant because we're finally able to see with real video, real pictures, this motion. And we've only been able to imagine it up till today. Thank you, Scott. And I believe we have a call uh, from Ken Kramer at Universe Today. Ken? Hey, thanks for taking my question, and uh, congratulations on uh, a great day. Um, yeah, my question is actually, I believe you have changed and enhanced this mission in the orbital plan. You've gone originally from uh, 11 days and 33 orbits to 14 days and 37 orbits and a year to 20 months. So um, I'm wondering how, how did you manage to, to do this, tell, tell us a little bit about, about that, that planning and changing, especially in light of um, you have these radiation hazards. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Okay. I've been voted to take that. Um, so originally our, our concept was 11 days. Um, and the 33 orbits was the 33 science orbits. There was always... Um, 
some phasing orbit that needed to happen and you had to have a capture orbit and we didn't usually count that in our total of the 33 orbits, which was really the science orbits, which were mapping Jupiter. Um, so at some point, when we, and, and we knew from the beginning when we were designing it that the 11 days was an example, but, uh, but there were other periods that would work. We, we really, what we really cared about was dropping down over the poles and capturing each longitude, longitude and laying a net or a map around Jupiter. And uh, also, during the cruise, as we flew out, um, we learned a little bit about the spacecraft, uh, especially at the Earth flyby. We uh, went into safe mode, and as we looked at that, I mean, it was uh, turned out to, to be a, uh, a little bit of a hiccup, but it wasn't very serious. The spacecraft actually behaved exactly as we wanted it to, and it, nothing um, bad happened. But we started to look and say, okay, if that were to happen at Jupiter, um, we would like to be able to recover and not lose an orbit. And we started to look at the timeline of how long it took to recover and was that, did we want to add a couple of days for conservatism to ensure the science mission? And we looked at op uh, opportunities to do that and we decided that adding three days uh, made sense. Um, it didn't change the science it, uh, and it made the uh, probability of success even greater. And that was really the basis of it. Um, the 37 orbits just means that we um, counted these two 53-day orbits that we uh, initially go into the capture period. It, um, you still have this basically um, the same number of phasing mapping orbits, or close to the same number. So we also evaluated the radiation, which was another part of your question, and um, and it and it wasn't much different. Mo you know, Juno was designed in a way to take. Um, data and at a very low risk and because the radiation slowly accumulates and then as you get to the later part of the mission it gets faster and faster accumulation and so um, we still retained all of that conservatism as well and the overall dose uh, was pretty much the same. And we designed the spacecraft to a radiation design margin of a minimum of two and so we accumulated a little bit more margin in this mission scenario and we found only one part that didn't meet that requirement. We did some additional testing and found out it worked just fine. So it's extremely resilient design, an extremely resilient spacecraft. Uh, and it was very easy to uh, have the same level of confidence that uh, it'll perform as expected, just like it did tonight. I also want to point out something that it's so, we've all have so ingrained in us uh, on the project that maybe um, people haven't, we're assuming people haven't realized, and, and that is, don't forget, the radiation we accumulate is not just the more time you spend, the more radiation. Each time we come in close to the planet, we get a dose of radiation, and then the spacecraft is out far from Jupiter and is relatively free from that radiation until we come in close again. So uh, changing from 11 days to 14 day orbits does not mean you get more radiation because you're there longer. It's really the number of times we come in close to Jupiter that determines how much radiation we're getting. Good okay, question. thank you. We're going to bring it back here to JPL. Please state your name and media affiliation. Steve Fuggerman from CBS News. I want to ask Scott, and anyone who wants to answer this, I have a couple questions, but first I want to ask you, the moment that we saw the cheering go up when the 35 minutes had come to an end, when you got the indication that it had gone very well, can you sort of take a step back and tell us what was going through your heart and mind after so many years being part of this project? Uh, a huge sigh of relief and excitement. I mean, we had a counter that we were watching as the burn happened, and I could see we were in orbit and it was shrinking. And, and, but the, at that moment, all that went through my mind was, wow, this thing was perfect. Uh, these engineers are amazing. I mean, I, I, it was just another example. I, I'm continuously amazed at NASA engineering. And I'm so happy to be a scientist working with these kind of engineers. And another question, this is really for any of you. Obviously, I'm guessing you have been fascinated by science and planetary science since you were young children. Is there a childlike question you've always wondered about Jupiter that you would love to have answered by this mission? I think many of us wonder about the clouds and the bands and the great red spot. I mean, what causes that? How could that stay there for 
hundreds of years. And why is it changing size now? I mean, it's the biggest, most mysterious planet, and it's the one that we can most easily see at night. So I think many of us have had questions uh, ever since we looked at the stars and the planets. Anyone else? I would, well, I would echo that. I've been fascinated by the red spot, but I think the question that um, comes to my mind that I've had my whole life that I'm hoping we get an answer to is, how'd we get here? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's really um, pretty fundamental to me. I'll, yeah. give, I'll give an answer that may, maybe isn't quite so childlike. As an engineer, um, I'm really curious how well this spacecraft is going to perform at, in the radiation of Jupiter, because there's so much out in the outer planets right now that is really exciting, not just the science community, but you know the public as well. Um, and so the more we can learn from an engineering point of view how to design spacecraft to go to the outer planets, and especially this is the first solar-powered mission to the outer planets, right? So you know instead of using nuclear power, um, we're using solar power, and that's really opening up a lot of opportunities in terms of the types of missions that we can send out there. Um, so from an engineering point of view, uh, I, there's so much that we're going to learn over the next year and a half. And, and there you have it, engineers versus scientists is how we look at things. <laughs> right, versus children. I, I got to say that, you know, you look out at the sky at night and you see things that are brighter and don't twinkle the way the stars do. And if you watch the sky enough, you see them moving. And people have probably wondered for centuries and centuries, thousands of years, what are those things out there and how did they get there? Well, you know, we've learned something over the years about what planets are, and we've learned a little bit about how do they get there, but that's kind of what we're trying to answer here, right, is how did Jupiter get to be Jupiter? How did our solar system get to be the solar system? Where does all this stuff, you know, the, this amazing universe that we see how does that work and how did it begin? So um, th there's, a, there's a whole range from, you know, can we do this job and how well can we make this work to, wow, where does that come from? How, does it, how, did, how did we begin? And that's one of the amazing things about working for NASA and working on big projects is you get to answer big questions. Okay, if I could just add from a, uh, from a headquarters perspective, uh, with over when the science mission director, with over 100 missions, each mission helps build upon another. And whether it's our astrophysics or earth science or, or, or planetary or heliophysics, they really interplay. And what we learn from one helps helps our future missions. So, this is just one tremendous uh, piece of the puzzle uh, of, of the bigger uh, you know the bigger mission set. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And I believe there's a question near the back there, sir. Hi, Matt Kaplan from the Planetary Society with congratulations for the whole team. Uh, easy one, I think. Will you make another approach video in August or on one of the following orbits that takes us all the way into the planet? That's the plan. <laughs> that, was, that was concise. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, any more questions from the floor? Uh, see, there's one right there, sir. Uh, hello, I've got a question. Um, so what information from this mission will you use for future missions, uh, like any possible mission for Europa? Mm -hmm. So I'll answer just, just a little bit. So uh, we mentioned the radiation environment. Europa has a, a really, really tough radiation environment. So the things that we're learning from this mission, there are also lots of firsts in this mission, whether it's the, you know, the solar arrays, uh, the solar power going out this far, something we would look at for Europa also. So there's really a lot of... Uh, a lot of things we would look at, but not only for Europa, for any of our other missions that are going out into deep space. Uh, what, what, what things specifically would you be learning that will be useful for um, future missions? Well, so as an example, the radiation environment itself. How, 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 do our, uh, how do our systems operate in this environment? Do we have the right shielding in place? Uh, and things like that. So it's spacecraft performance, but not only that, instrument performance. There are parts of the instruments that are really outside the, the, what we have as our radiation shielding. And so it's really understanding the health of the spacecraft, the instruments, uh, and the communication system, really. So it's, it's looking at the, at the total, the total uh, operation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jeff, and the gentleman in the back row. Douglas Messier from Parabolic Arc. Uh, what are the major constraints on the mission in terms of the length of time? Is it the radiation? Is it fuel? Is it all of those things? It, it's basically the radiation. OK. And can you describe some of the instruments on board in terms just briefly what, you, what you'll be measuring and what instruments you have? Um, sure. So uh, we um, measure the gravity field of, of Jupiter with a radio science experiment, so we're looking at the communications and the Doppler shift and the frequency, so it, looking at the acceleration and deceleration of the spacecraft itself to study the interior of Jupiter. We have magnetometers on board to look at the magnetic field and how that's generated deep inside the interior. We have microwave radiometers that see the heat that's glowing out of Jupiter. It's a warm body. It's it's glowing in the microwave, so we watch that to measure the water and see how deep the zones and belts in the great red spot are. Uh, we also have ultraviolet and infrared uh, spectrometers, spectrographs, and imagers, um, charged particles, high energy and low energy to study the auroras and the northern and southern lights, which are the most powerful in the solar system. We have a plasma wave instrument that gives you the interaction of these particles with the magnetic field and how energy is moved around, but it also makes these great sound systems where you hear the bow shock. Um, and then finally we have um, JunoCam, which gets the visible color images that you just saw. I think I covered them all there. I was trying to count. So, I think you got everything. So, so we have a very, very extensive payload. And all of those are state-of-the-art instruments that are very, very advanced. And something like the microwave is actually a new instrument. OK, thank you. Scott, uh, lady to my left. Catherine Leeper, Boing Boing. Um, how close to real time or how sped up was the video that we just saw? Um, I think that video was 17 days, and you watched it in three minutes. <laughs> so, um, which I think is more enjoyable. <laughs> Great. I believe there's another question over there. Uh, no? All right. Uh, Jason, social media, a couple of questions for you. Indeed. Uh, many people are actually asking about the uh, JunoCam images that, uh, that have come up here. And uh, would you like to know if all the raw images are going to be released or only the interesting ones? <laughs> so that's the same set. Um, our plan is to release them all. Uh, we're not quite ready technically to put all of those out, which is why we made that movie. But yes, everything will get released to the public, and they will be able to make their own movies. All right, next question here uh, comes from a Twitter user who asks, uh, what will be the first instrument you turn on and why, and what will be the most important instrument? The most important <laughs> instrument? You're, you're trying to get to say, my science team to fight children. with me. <laughs> um, there is no most important instrument. They're all equally important, just like my children. Um, the, and I think they all go on at the same time, just like I feed my children all at the same time. <laughs> OK, thank you, Scott. Uh, any, more, any more questions from here at JPL? Uh, in the front row there. Hi, Bruce Lieberman, Air and Space Magazine. Um, you said that in a couple of days you'll be turning the instruments on as you're moving away from Jupiter. What, what kind of data will you be taking, or will you be testing the health of the instruments? What, what, what will? What will you be doing after you turn them on? Uh, well, we'll start taking data immediately, but, um, but we're not that close. I mean, the primary science goals of Juno are associated with the very, very closest approaches to Jupiter. So you're looking at a couple of hours. So even being a couple of days out means that you don't get this, the gravity science of the interior and looking deep inside the thing. But we'll turn them all on and make sure that, and some of it will be calibration. Um, but when you go out into the deep magnetosphere, most of that science is actually magnetospheric science and studying of the magnetosphere and the aurora and how all of that is working. Um, but we will also be taking images as we leave the planet. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's going to wrap it up for here at JPL. Uh, thank you for joining us for the uh, post-JOI briefing. Uh, for more information about the Juno mission, 
at Jupiter, please visit, visit us at www.nasa.gov slash Juno and mission.juno.swri.edu. And for those of you who want to join in on the conversation, uh, Juno has a Facebook as well as Twitter accounts, and that's facebook.com slash NASA Juno and twitter.com slash NASA Juno. Uh, after we conclude our broadcast, NASA TV will rerun uh, the limited set of images that we had, but they're great images, of course, uh, that we had during this panel discussion. And that's it from here at JPL and Jupiter for this evening. Hope you guys have a great July 5th. about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the window. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. You're in our field with you now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap.